Hiromu Arakawa's Full Metal Alchemist is one of the highest rated mangas of all time, and rightfully so. The story is terrific from its very exposition right to its conclusion, with plotlines that give you a racing heartbeat, characters that make you fall in love, and climaxes that dramatically reduce your bathroom breaks, Full Metal Alchemist has it all. With great mangas come anime adaptations, and Full Metal Alchemist has had not one, but two of them. While the 2003 version ceases to be faithful to the manga after a point, due to the anime getting ahead of the manga's release, the 2009 animation sticks to the source material. Because this is a story that doesn't reveal its primary antagonist until much later, Full Metal Alchemist and Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhoods have different characters as their final antagonists. And with that, the storyline of another crucial character gets altered drastically due to his involvement with the big bad guy, or girl. Needless to say, this character happens to be Van Hohenheim, the father of the Elric brothers who went MIA when his sons were pretty young due to reasons that were pretty much beyond his control. Although he is presented as a deadbeat father from the perspective of Edward Elric, there's much, much more to Van Hohenheim than meets the eye, and that is exactly what we're going to talk about today. He's kind of a mad scientist in the original anime, Van Hohenheim in Full Metal Alchemist 2003. So, he had somewhat of a nickname in the 2003 anime where he was referred to as Hohenheim of Light. Of course, he was still a father to Ed and Al while being a brilliant alchemist, but they were not his only children. More on that later. Though he had the physical body of a 40-year-old, his soul was almost 400. His unusual age is slightly evident in the 43rd episode of the series, where he meets Winry Rockbell in Resinbul and confuses her for her mother, Sarah Rockbell. He then visits the house of the Rockbells where Pinnacle Rockbell reveals his identity as the patriarch of the Elric family. Edward Elric reveals his fury at the sight of Hohenheim, but Alphonse goes against his brother's wishes and tries to reconnect with their father. But one question continues to linger in the minds of the viewers. Why was he gone for so long? Let's go back by 400 years. One thing out of the many that set Full Metal Alchemist apart from Brotherhood is the main antagonist. While we have previously covered Father in a separate video, the 2003 series found its antagonist in a woman named Dante. In the past, Hohenheim used to be romantically involved with Dante, who is a twisted but genius alchemist. With thousands of people from that era dying of the plague while others were being captured in the notorious witch hunts, Hohenheim created the Philosopher's Stone. He almost died due to the resulting reaction, but Dante ended up using the stone and the souls of the sacrificed people to save Hohenheim. As she attached the stone and another man's body to his soul, Hohenheim found life once again, but naturally, the body would not last him forever. Dante underwent the same procedure to prolong her life using the souls from the stone. So together, they jumped from body to body as they continued to live eternally. Together, they had a son who unfortunately passed away at the age of 18 as a result of mercury poison. Heartbroken due to the death of his only son, Hohenheim dabbled into what is considered to be taboo in the world of alchemy and performed human transmutation. The act did not bring his son back, but it did end up giving rise to the first ever homunculus, Envy. In a way, Full Metal Alchemist has been much darker than Brotherhood, with failed human transmutations resulting in the creation of the homunculus being one of the pivotal reasons that add to this. For example, Izumi Curtis failed to bring back her stillborn son and her human transmutation birthed wrath. Scar's brother could not cope with the loss of his lover and the human transmutation he performed birthed lust. And most importantly, the failed transmutation performed by the Elric brothers gave rise to sloth. With the creation of Envy, Hohenheim became much more desolate than before. Unable to cope with the regret of what he had done to his son, Hohenheim fled. However, the bodies he continued to acquire to sustain the life of his soul proved to be less than reliable. With each jump, the body would rot faster. He went missing in action with the hopes that his absence would cause Dante to stop. However, with Dante setting her eyes on the Elric brothers, Hohenheim of Light had no choice but to resurface. Too bad he was soon intercepted by Sloth, the homunculus of Trisha Elric. The intervention led to Hohenheim finding himself in the Gate of Alchemy, where his mind, body, and soul were separated from one another. It took him a lot of effort to reassemble the dismantled parts of himself, but he was unable to go back to his previous life. As he found himself on the other side of the gate, Hohenheim of Light was brought to the real world, or rather, the world that we, the readers and viewers, live in. 
Of course, in this world, alchemy is nothing but the forerunner of what we refer to as chemistry. No such things as transmutation circles and equivalent exchanges. Hohenheim found himself in London during the time of the Second World War. Following Edward's last altercation with Dante, he was able to return Al's soul to his original body. However, alchemy is about equivalent exchange, and to get Al's body back, Edward sacrificed himself and found himself on the other side of the gate as well. Edward and Hohenheim reconnected in London, where the latter was acting as an advisor to Winston Churchill. Around this time, Edward gradually learned about Hohenheim's past, and it was also revealed that the Elric family patriarch could never return to where he came from because his entire being was on one side now. As the series came to an end, it was revealed that Hohenheim had relocated to Germany and was siding with the Thule Society. His end goal did not have much to do with this new world, as he was focused on finding a way to send Edward back to his homeworld. As the story came to an end in the film Conqueror of Shambhala, Hohenheim became the prisoner of the Thule Society, who were using him as a sacrifice on their side of the gate. Envy resurfaced in the form of a dragon-like being, and Hohenheim sacrificed himself to force Envy into opening the gate, ultimately being chewed down by his first son. He's introduced as the pinnacle of a deadbeat dad, Van Hohenheim's debut in Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. The story of Full Metal Alchemist began with Edward and Alphonse trying to bring back their mother, Trisha Elric, from the dead. Together, they broke the laws of alchemy and performed human transmutation, only for it to be a complete failure that not only did nothing to bring their mother back, but also took away Al's body, Edward's right arm, and his left leg. With Alphonse confined to a metal armor, Edward made the decision to burn their house down as the brothers set off on a journey to find the Philosopher's Stone and restore Alphonse's body. Throughout it all, their father, Van Hohenheim, was practically absent for years. While on their journey, Ed and Al sought out their alchemy teacher, Izumi Curtis, hoping to learn about the Philosopher's Stone from her. Although she claimed to have little knowledge of it, she went on to reveal her interaction with a man in Central City who apparently knew a good deal about the Philosopher's Stone. To the boy's surprise, she expressed that the man was called Van Hohenheim whom Edward and Alphonse immediately recognized as their absent father. It was clear that Edward loathed Hohenheim, for he had not only abandoned them, but left their mother to struggle and eventually pass away. Due to him detesting his father, Ed was against going to him for help. But Izumi also mentioned how Hohenheim's end goal, which was associated with the stone, was on its way to fruition. A few episodes later, Edward returned to his hometown of Rezimbul and headed to the house of the Rockbells. However, a visit to his mother's grave brought him face to face with the man who had abandoned him all those years ago. Van Hohenheim greeted Edward in front of his late wife's grave and revealed to have a knowledge of them having performed human transmutation. A rage-filled Ed responded with Rezimbul no longer having a place for Hohenheim, who did not pay much attention to his son's words. Instead, he was more focused on how their family house was gone. An angry Ed explained how he burned the house down so that the brothers did not have the option to look back on their goal. However, Hohenheim was quick at sniffing out the real reason for it, as he mentioned how they must have done it to hide the traces of their sin and run away from painful memories. Hohenheim sought out Ed once again that evening as he reminisced over the times when the latter was an infant. While Ed pretended to be asleep to avoid his father, Hohenheim engaged in a dialogue with Panaco Rockbell, who was astonished at how Hohenheim looked the same as he used to several years ago. While Edward eavesdropped on the conversation, Hohenheim went on to inquire with Pinaco about what the brothers had transmuted and whether it was truly Trisha or not bringing up the possibility that they might have destroyed their bodies over something that was totally unrelated to them or Trisha. As Van Hohenheim left Rezimbul, he took the Elric family photo with himself and advised Pinaco to leave Amestris as something terrible was going to happen to the country. After she refused to do so, Hohenheim lamented about never being able to break bread with her again. Edward digs up Trisha's corpse with Pinaco later that day, only to learn that what they had transmuted was completely unrelated to their mother proving that Hohenheim's theory was true after all. A man with a terrifying secret and a tragic family story. Van Hohenheim's disturbing past and mysterious connection to the main players of the series. 
Later in the story, Edward journeys to a distant land of legend as a state alchemist in the 18th episode of Brotherhood. This land, known as Xerxes, was the birthplace of the art of alchemy. Once a glorious civilization, Xerxes and its population had infamously collapsed and ceased to exist overnight, with millions of people vanishing from the face of the country. However, the country birthed fabled legends of the traveler from the east and the traveler from the west, who introduced alchemy and alkahestry to the western world and the eastern world respectively. Edward had also spotted tattered remains of a transmutation circle among the ruins of Xerxes, giving more truth to the fabled legends. Although Ed continued to stay in the dark about who those travelers were, the one who introduced alchemy to the east was none other than Van Hohenheim himself. Meanwhile, the other traveler was none other than the main antagonist of Brotherhood, Father. We got to see Van Hohenheim with the man known as Father in the 27th episode of the series, where Hohenheim seemed to be at a festival with Pinico Rockbell. While Pinico offered him drinks and asked him to loosen up and join the celebration, Hohenheim was worried about the more pressing matters of a mistress. He goes on to mention that ever since King Bradley had taken over as the country's Führer, a mistress constantly seemed to be at war. In reality, this was because Father had created a mistress and its dummy government for his personal purposes, and with Bradley being the homunculus Wrath, the wars were orchestrated by Father himself to bring him closer to his end goal. A nationwide transmutation circle had been created underneath a mistress. Wars and mass murders were conducted above the key points of the circle, so that Father could ultimately sacrifice the people of the country and gain powers beyond that of God. These little details were not mentioned in Hohenheim's conversation with Pinico, who soon left his side to partake in the festivities. With Hohenheim all by himself, he was soon joined by a man who went on to mention how humans were fragile, how they cowered at darkness and never stood up to it, how they dealt with their issues by trying to escape reality because they were such weak creatures. However, they were not useless after all because they could be used as a precious resource. It was soon revealed that this man was a doppelganger of Hohenheim's, although he had more wrinkles and did not wear glasses. Not only did this confuse the viewers, but it would go on to confuse the Elric brothers as well, who were stunned to stand before the face of Hohenheim when they met the antagonist, Father. At first, they believed that the root cause behind all the evil was the man who was their own father, but they soon realized the one who stood in front of them was someone else altogether. However, he seemed to know about Hohenheim. This was because the origins of Van Hohenheim and Father were very much linked with one another. 400 years ago, when the civilization in Xerxes was alive and thriving, Van Hohenheim used to be a slave. He had no name and was referred to as Slave Number 23. Confined to a cellar stocked with flasks and books, the slave used to resemble Edward Elric. He soon heard a voice calling to him, and the sound was coming from a nearby flask. Inside the flask was a black sphere with no form, but an eye that resembled the one from the Gate of Truth. It was revealed that the thing in the flask was born from the blood of this very slave, as the latter's master was experimenting. On learning that the slave had no name due to his societal position as a slave, this much wiser dwarf in the flask paid his gratitude for being given his life by naming him Theophrastus Bombastus Van Hohenheim. The slave thought this name was much too long for him to remember and decided to stick to Van Hohenheim. On learning that the slave had no desire or requirement to educate himself, the creature chastised him for staying bound to his lowly life. Soon Hohenheim learned that he was the very first homunculus and was taught how to read, write, and perform alchemy. As he grew into manhood, Hohenheim became the creature's alchemical apprentice and was grateful to it for providing him the necessary knowledge. To Hohenheim, this meant that he could leave his life as a slave behind and proceed to have a family. To the homunculus, the human need to form communities and breed was stupid. While Hohenheim explained how such acts made humans happy, the homunculus claimed that merely being able to escape his flask would make him happy. It was later summoned by the aging King of Xerxes, who asked the all-knowledgeable being if it was possible for him to be immortal. Homunculus took the opportunity to explain how he could create a philosopher's stone, and the king got his men to draw a nationwide transmutation circle in Xerxes. Slaughters of entire towns were secretly ordered at strategic locations while a five-point circle was created in the throne room. It took several years for the entire procedure to come to fruition, and on the final day, the procedure was set into motion. However, with a twist in the events, Hohenheim witnessed in horror how the king and his guards began to die one after the other. 
Homunculus revealed that he had skewed the circle so that he himself and Van Hohenheim would stand at the true center while everyone else would have their souls sacrificed. This ultimately resulted in the opening of the Gate of Truth, which swallowed the citizens of Xerxes and condensed their souls to a single point. Meanwhile, Homunculus and Hohenheim were broken down in the Gate, resulting in each acquiring half of the souls of the people of Xerxes, granting them ridiculously long lives. Meanwhile, Homunculus, who was now free, had acquired the appearance of Hohenheim due to having his blood. This immortal body had the gift of not aging, leaving Hohenheim as the last surviving citizen of Xerxes, after which he traveled to the east of the world and spread his knowledge. In the present, Hohenheim demonstrated his terrific alchemy skills on Izumi Curtis, who was astonished by his total neglect of the equivalent exchange. When asked why he could perform such a feat, he revealed to her how he was a philosopher's stone in human form. He wasn't around for their childhood, but it wasn't because he didn't love them. It was because he was busy preparing to save the world. Van Hohenheim's true purpose. Following his departure from Xerxes, Hohenheim fled to the east and wandered aimlessly across the Great Desert. He became more and more aware of the cries of the souls inside him and began to memorize their names. However, his exhaustion led to him collapsing in the sand. He was then found by travelers from an eastern country called Zing and was brought back by them. Having gained his strength once again, Hohenheim began to teach alchemy to the Zingy's people. The people combined Hohenheim's teachings with the rudimentary alchemy of the land, giving rise to alkahestry, which, unlike alchemy, drew power from the chi of the earth. Hohenheim eventually left Zing and spent several centuries abroad. Eventually, he arrived in Amestris and settled in Rezimbul, where he became friends with Pinaco Rockbell and fell in love with Trisha Elric. Although he knew that he would outlive her, Trisha gave him the courage to live his life the right way, empowering him to date and marry her. Needless to say, the couple went on to give birth to two sons. In the 36th episode, we were shown a distraught Hohenheim who kept calling out the names of the souls within his body. He scratched his chest and bits of the Philosopher's Stone fell out of his body. His wife, Trisha Elric, knew of his truth. While Hohenheim believed that his body was cursed and that he could have passed it on to his children, Trisha encouraged him to interact with Ed and Al. However, Hohenheim continued to be resentful of his condition as he was immortal, which meant that he would have to witness the deaths of his wife and children. As a result, Trisha arranged to take a family portrait of all four of them so that Hohenheim would have something to hold on to in the future, something that would remind him of a fond memory. Hohenheim was moved to tears as they got their portrait, as he realized that his only wish was to grow old and die with his wife. As such, he resolved to find a way to do so, which took him back to his study room. Unfortunately, the relentless studying led to Hohenheim making a shocking discovery, as he realized that Father had created a mistress from scratch to repeat the same incident as that of Xerxes. As the only man who could stop it, Hohenheim realized that he needed to leave his happy life and go on a journey to put an end to the madness. This was the reason why he left the Elrics and acquired the reputation of being an absent father. While Edward believed that his father did not care for them, his accusations could not have been farther from the truth. Later, he engaged in a duel with the homunculus called Pride, who had the body of King Bradley's son and a form that resembled the dwarf in the flask. He revealed to Pride that he would eventually make a visit to Father and asked him to let the first homunculus know that he would soon be visited by Slave Number 23, indirectly declaring war on him. The D-Day Father had been orchestrating all this while was the promised day. On this day of the eclipse, he would sacrifice the five people who had opened the Gate of Truth, namely the Elric brothers, Hohenheim, Izumi Curtis, and Roy Mustang. He would do this to open the Gate of Truth and acquire all of its power, becoming someone above God. The alchemists of Central and Hohenheim were hell-bent on putting an end to Father's plan, as they could not allow the tragedy of Xerxes to be repeated. However, the Elrics also needed the Gate to be opened because they needed to get Al's body back, which was awaiting their arrival in front of that very gate. Hohenheim became the de facto leader of this expedition and proposed his counterplans to the team. As he came across Father once again, he was stabbed by the latter, who absorbed a portion of the Philosopher's Stone. Due to Hohenheim having created a relationship with the souls, they destroyed Father's human container as their attack. However, by this time, Father could exist without the need for a physical form. And yet, Father went on to absorb Hohenheim, 
although he could not absorb all of them since that would kill Father. Fortunately, with Greed slashing away at Father, Hohenheim was free, but this fortune died out soon when Father used the nationwide transmutation circle to sacrifice every soul in Amestris, barring the five sacrifices, Riza, May, Greed, or Ling, the living homunculi, and the chimeras. As a result, Father gained the form and strength he desired all along, with God allegedly residing within him. Hohenheim finally played the wild card as he used his mapped path of the moon's shadow as the eclipse passed the crucial points of the five-point circle. He had placed philosopher's stones throughout the country and created the umbral circle based on Alkahestry, which countered Father's nationwide transmutation circle. This counterattack stripped Father of the Amestrian souls within him, returning them to their original bodies. With Father's body being stripped of its soul while having to contain godly power, it gradually began to disintegrate. His attacks were still offensive, but Hohenheim was immune to it, as he continued to drain more and more of the lives from Father's Philosopher's Stone. However, Father went on to use some of the remaining souls to create humans resembling the dead Xerxians. He then released a gigantic explosive force, which Hohenheim intercepted himself to shield others. The attacks subsequently depleted almost all of his Philosopher's Stone, rendering him incapable of fighting further. After passing the baton to Edward and the others, Father was finally finished off with some help from Greed, leaving Edward with the one task of bringing Alphonse's body back. Although Hohenheim offered the rest of his life for the necessary equivalent exchange, Edward turned down his offer and asked why Hohenheim offered his life. He said he did it because he was their father, and as a result, just wanted to see his children happy and fulfilled proving to us once again how Hohenheim deeply loved his family. It was also at this time that a teary Edward finally accepted Hohenheim for the first time in many years. Ultimately, Ed sacrificed his alchemy at the Gate of Truth and brought Alphonse's body back, who was greeted by the warmth of his father taking his hand. Towards the end of the story, Hohenheim kneeled in front of Trisha's grave and eventually passed away in that position while having a genuine smile plastered on his face while his life force ran dry. In an extra comic, the readers got to see Hohenheim's spirit meeting with Trisha's, as her spirit waited for him in their former home. Marvelous Verdict! What starts off as a mysterious story that makes us question Van Hohenheim's intentions eventually proves to be a tale of tragedy. He has easily had the most painful life out of all the characters in Arakawa's story. He has seen days as a slave. He is the last citizen of a civilization. He has been the vessel for anguished souls screaming within him. He has lived for way too long. He has had to sacrifice his beloved family for the greater good. And yet, he did not get to realize his wish of growing old with his wife and watching his children grow. However, he fortunately found his bittersweet ending as he was accepted by Edward and got to hold Alphonse once again. With that, today's video comes to an end. What did you think of Van Hohenheim? Did you enjoy this video? If so, then don't forget to like and comment below. Until then, thanks for watching, stay safe out there, and have a marvelous day.